So, good afternoon. I'm Dr Ruth Davidson. I'm a research fellow here at the Mile End Institute and I'm really pleased to be chairing this panel discussion on women in British politics with three distinguished women politicians. Baroness Morris of Yardley, Bar Baroness Primrolo of Windmill Hill and Dame Margaret Hodge. Our intention had been to have a cross-party panel but we've had a few cancellations but we're really grateful for our three panellists for making time to speak to us today after what has been a difficult week for so many. Now as the discussions at this conference have highlighted, women have made progress in political life over the past decades and their presence in public office has facilitated policy change, but not without pioneer women facing challenges and with much more still to be achieved. And I can think of no better group of panellists to consider these issues, given their wealth of experience in local and national government. Estelle Morris was a Labour MP for Birmingham, Yardley, between 1992 and 2005. She was, made minister of, she was made a Minister in the Department of Education in 1997 and made Secretary of State for Education and Skills in 2001. She was raised to the Lords in 2005 and now, amongst her many voluntary activities, a lot concerned with education. She was appointed President of the National Children's Bureau in 2005. Dawn Primarolo was elected as Labour MP for Bristol South in 1987. She was Opposition Spokesman for Health and the Treasury before becoming Financial Secretary to the Treasury in 1997 and as Paymaster General between 1999 and 2007, the longest serving person in this role. In 2010 she was Deputy Speaker of the House before standing down in 2015. Margaret Hodge was elected to the parliamentary seat of Barking in 1994. Prior to this, she had a long-standing career in local government, becoming leader of the council in Islington between 1982 and 1992. And having held a number of ministerial roles, she's currently chair of the Public Accounts Committee. And at the end of 2021, she announced she would not be standing at the next election. For the next 45 minutes, we'll reflect on some of the issues faced by women politicians as these three uh, delegates have experienced them, before opening up the discussion to questions from the audience for the last 30 minutes of the session. So I'm going to ask each of our three um, participants to answer in turn a number five questions, um, and then we'll hopefully come back to some more general discussion at the end. So to start the discussion, I wanted to ask all of you to cast your minds back to the early parts of your careers. Given the well-known problems women have had getting into Parliament, what were the springboards that encouraged you to stand as an MP? And I'm thinking here about things such as family support, supportive political networks, or local activism. I'm going to ask uh, Estelle first, if that's okay. Okay, it, it is thinking back quite a few years now as well, but um, thanks for inviting me, and uh, it's good to see a good audience here. I want to split that into two bits, uh, if, if I may, because as you were asking the question, it struck me that, that I've got two different answers. I'll say first what was the springboard for me being interested in politics, but that's a bit different than becoming an MP, because I could have been interested in politics all my life and either never wanted to be an MP or never managed to get an MP. And the answers are actually really quite different. So I was lucky in a way, because my dad was an MP. Uh, it, I was born in Manchester. And I don't, that makes it sound as though I come from a, a family of politicians that go back you know, to the 1500s or whatever. And that wasn't the case. He was of that generation of people who left school at 14, never went to university, went straight into work, uh, joined the trade union movement and got to be an MP in the Manchester constituency where he was born and brought up. But what that meant was that I never went through that phase where I thought, is politics for someone like me? Politics was for someone like me because it was surrounded me all my life. My mum met my dad, my mum had a similar childhood to my dad in the Labour League of Youth, um, which was now what we call the Young Socialists. So although we, we weren't wealthy or anything like that, but we were rich in having a conversation in our household about politics and about the Labour Party. So that phrase, but Labour Party was part of my family. I, I never had to get over a barrier that said, Politics, me. Do you think they'll let me in? Do you think they'll talk to me? Do you think they'll ask for my opinion? And I've got a sister who's four years younger, who's probably I'm brighter than me. She's done better than me educationally, but she's interested in politics, but only as a citizen, not as a Labour Party member. She campaigned for me, she campaigned for my dad, but she's never joined the Labour Party. So I don't know why 
I'm a party politician, she's not. So that's the first answer to the question. It was never difficult for me to be involved in politics. And I was brought up with stories from both my grandparents and my parents that explained our family in terms of politics. So when we talked about why they hoped I might go to university, but they never did, they'd always say, that's because we joined a trade union and fought for it. That's because we were in the Labour Party. So that's that bit. But coming to be the MP was a bit more difficult. I always wanted to be an MP. I knew I wanted to be an MP. But I had much more of a, gosh, is that for, might I make it? Am I good enough to make it? Even though I had a really good role model of my dad. So when we come on to the, maybe the part of the discussion that's, well, how did you come to an MP? I felt that they're not barriers. Everybody has barriers. I had a, I spent 18 years teaching. I had a barrier to getting into teaching. Nothing's ever easy, but there are there are things that made it a challenge to get to become an MP, which are to do with I had a full time job as a teacher in an inner city secondary school in Coventry. I didn't work for the party. I wasn't in London. Um, you know, I was teaching in Coventry and living in Warwick District. It wasn't the centre of the Labour Party universe. And it was quite difficult to get a constituency to be an MP. So there was that. So I've got two bits. I don't know if that's all right as an answer. The first bit, it was dead easy for me to get involved in politics. I had it easy and I, I, I licked it up. I, I loved it. I loved it. And to live in this household where the conversation was about politics was both a joy and a privilege. But to get to be an MP, I think there were things that made it more difficult for me than they did many men. And particularly the, the thing I'd draw there was people living in London and people doing their politics outside of London, mm -hmm. which you might want to pick up later on in the conversation. So I hope that's all right as a, as yes, a starter. that's great as a starter. I'm going to take my lead from Estelle actually and divide it into two parts because I think my story is different. So it is really great to be here, although quite a challenge for me to think all the way back to 1986 and then the election in 87. So I, I'm, the first part is about the politics. I didn't, I didn't come from a political family. In fact, I didn't even come from a family that unanimously supported Labour. My dad voted Tory and my mum voted uh, Labour. And um, I'm the eldest of five. And uh, when I was lucky enough in those days to be able for my parents to keep me on to do my A-levels, but not, be able, not to be able to fund me beyond that. To go to university, I had to go out to work. Uh, it's not a bad thing to go out to work, but it did sound like I was making it a negative. So um, I didn't have that rich background. Um, and I learned my politics as a community activist um, in campaigns about um, women's rights, um, in the local community working uh, with uh, an organisation that was called the Claimants Union um, in the days when people, they barely know their rights now but they definitely didn't know them then to make sure that people received what they were entitled to. I worked, um, worked in the private sector and um, active in organisations that you might remember, they're still around. Um, the very first city farm, which was very much the beginning of environmental concerns. But what drove me, and I suppose it's because I, I think it's because I'm the eldest of five, is that in, in my childhood, nobody ever told me I wasn't as good as mm. the next person. Yeah whether it was a man or a woman. So it came quite, quite shocked to me when I went to the world of work that actually there's a discrimination. And um, that 
inequality, that discrimination, that lack of fairness through my um, community activism uh, drove me. And I came back to London. Um, I was born in Bow, and my parents moved out to a new town. Very, I know I don't speak with an East End accent, but you know, new towns do that, two accents. And I worked um, first in a private company when the docks were still here at the end of Burdett Road um, as an assistant to um, the company secretary as his deputy, because it was a he. And then I worked in Stepney Green Law Centre. And that drove me even harder about the unfairness. And you know, not to be disrespectful to my predecessors, in the Labour Party, but they were nearly all men. They did think they knew everything. And in particular, they thought they knew best and that they could represent my views. And I, I don't take that approach. I think Parliament has to represent all of our views so that people look at Parliament and say, that person's like me. They've got my background. They understand. Uh, my situation. So that's sort of my politics. And then I ended up in Bristol, um, married, became a single parent, decided I wanted to go to university. I did an undergraduate. Um, and then I was on postgraduate studies at Bristol University in the days when there were things called ESRC awards that paid you to do your PhDs. So that was my route into being politically active. But I didn't see myself and had no desire to be a member of parliament, even though I then did it for nearly 30 years. Um, and how I came to be a member of parliament was through the campaigns in the Labour Party. And I think we will unpack this representation of women. Um, in those days, we were campaigning with badges that said, women make policy, not tea. And we were trying to get one woman onto every parliamentary shortlist. And the MP of the constituency that I lived in was the chief whip of the Labour Party, a guy called Michael Cox. And my friend said to me, you'll have to stand. We've got to make up the numbers. And we won't get a woman if you don't stand, but don't worry, we'll support you. And what's more important, you won't win. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and uh, then I think going on to some of your other questions, which we can unpack, which is, so what support mechanisms were there for me as a single parent? Um, how did I balance those things? Um, but all through my active years in frontline politics as a councillor and then an MP was to understand, to value everybody's view even if I don't agree with it, to draw on people's experience to develop policy. And if you can't explain it, don't do it. So that sort of, and that came from my community um, activism as well. So quite a different but nonetheless important route in in terms of the breadth of what makes up Parliament, I think. <laughs> We're learning everything. We're learning stuff about ourselves <laughs> now <laughs> with each other and the friends. Well, I've been for 30 years. I know. We are of a different generation, so I think what we're telling you is, is uh, very different from what you hear from yeah. women who are coming in now, and yeah. I think we've got it's to very say that. very important point. Um, uh, I'm the third of five, actually, Dawn, so, oh, wow. <laughs> so I'm the rebel in my family, which is how I always explain myself. Uh, the, middle, the middle child is, is often the rebel, uh, and um, uh, all come, come from a family. I was kicked out of, I was almost kicked out of home. In, uh, when, in my, when I first voted in uh, the 60s, because I, I voted Labour, and uh, uh, the La Labour Party was going to nationalise steel, 
when my dad worked in the steel industry. So literally, he kicked me out of home for a couple of days <laughs> for, for misbehaving. How did I get into politics? I, I got in, uh, we weren't a particularly political family, but we, uh, I was a rebel. And I just got in through political activism. So my early act, um, activism was through uh, CND. Um, <clears throat> uh, set, you know, uh, I was selling the CND paper at the age of 16 outside foils on a Saturday and going on those marches. And then I was active in an anti-apartheid movement. So I was active in those national movements. Um, I, was, I, I was a very, very early feminist. I went to the very, very early um, what were known as consciousness raising days in, in the 60s with a woman called Sheila Robotter mm -hmm. yes. uh, uh, in Hackney. Uh, so I, I went to those, uh, to, to, to those, and feminism has always been an important part of my life. Um, I never wanted to be an MP, if I'm absolutely honest. Um, I got involved in local politics, and that was through community activism. Uh, I'd moved into an area that was being in, in North London, which was being used to be a sort of white work, well, it used to be a working class area with a lot of controlled rent, uh, rent uh, people living in controlled tenancy, to, in tenancy of controlled rents. And it was beginning to get gentrified and uh, uh, people were literally, my next door neighbor had a rat put in her, she lived in the basement without an inside loo, without anything at all. And she had a rat put in her, um, by her landlord in her home to, to encourage her to leave. And that got me involved in fighting for her. And that led to me being active uh, locally. Uh, and if I'm honest, being, it's, uh, I went on to the council. I went on, you said that, I became leader of the council. And the reason for doing that was very funny. I was a member of the Labour Party. I went to Labour Party meetings. Um, I had my first, I've got four children. I had my first child. Uh, and although I had thought I'd want to do nothing other than be a mum, when I actually had the kids, I realised <laughs> it wasn't quite enough. Uh, and so I was pregnant with my second, and uh, a friend of mine, there's, there was a famous economist who worked for uh, Harold Wilson called Caldor, yeah. and his daughter was, was um, active in our, in, our, in our party, and she said to me, I was pregnant with number two, really frustrated, I was doing bits of work here and there, but couldn't do my full-time job because I, it had involved international travel. She said to me, go on the council, it'll keep you sane whilst you're changing nappies. And that was really, so I got involved in becoming an elected uh, representative nearly 50 years ago now, on the back of being that, and I thought I'd do it for a couple of years and get and give up. And I describe politics as a bit of a drug, yeah, um, uh, so that once you get engaged, it's, you know, the, there are good times and bad times, but um, you do, uh, the good times keep you going, and it's very, very difficult to give up. I did try and give it up when, after we'd lost the fourth election in 92, and then uh, moving forward to high, but then became an MP, that was quite interesting. So actually, as the up, there were very few women MPs. Um, Tessa Giles, some of you might have heard of, used to say, she went in in nine. She said she there were eighty-seven and ninety. Yeah, ninety-two. Ninety-two. I thought. 92. She, I, I may be wrong. But I anyway, she used to say there are more people whose first, more male MPs oh, whose first name is John yeah, than there are women MPs, MPs in Parliament. So it's not that. I know it feels a long time ago for you, but that's uh, quite a quite a thing yeah. to say. So I had never wanted to become a member of Parliament. I loved doing local government. I loved being in the. I loved the change that I could. Uh, uh, create in, in, in the area in which I lived. I didn't like the pomposity of Parliament and I just thought I, it wasn't for me. I preferred to uh, do, I'm a doer, uh, as indeed are both my colleagues here, but I didn't want to get involved in politics in, in Parliament. And then I'd given it up for a bit and the predecessor, I, I represent a city down, uh, a, a constituency down the road and she died, and I, um, and I remember coming home from work that day after she died with all these post-it notes on my, uh, I live in a house with stairs saying, Margaret, you've got to go for it. And my heart sank because my youngest of my four children was still, she was 12 or 13, and I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to cope with four kids and becoming an MP. But I also then uh, and, um, decided that I'd have, if I didn't go for it, I kicked myself yeah. later on in life, so went for it. And this is quite interesting. I'm going to tell you two funny stories about it. So I went for Barking. 
it was when we had just introduced a new system of selecting candidates of one member, one vote. So it wasn't done previously, it had been done through a representative uh, system of trade unions and delegates into a into the committee, into the main committee of the party at local level. So it was one member, one vote. I knew nobody in Barking except for the leader of the council who had encouraged me to stand. So I thought I'd go to the women's section. <laughs> so I go off to the women's section thinking maybe I'll pick up a vote or two here and gave a spiel about what I wanted to do for Barking and why I wanted to stand for Barking. It all went fine. And then this is East End, London, uh, 1994. The, uh, the women, and the women were mainly pensioners at that time. So they were probably people who were born in the 1920s and 1930s, thereabouts. Uh, and then I got three questions. The first was, would I change the abortion law? Because they were, a lot of them were Catholics. Mm. Uh, so I said no to that. The second one was, would I bring back hanging? And I thought, crumbs, what have I got into? It was a uh, big issue in the early 90s, it really was. <laughs> uh, and I, I said, I didn't think I'd do that either. And the third question was, would I stop immigration? Uh, and that was, uh, uh, and I myself am an immigrant, I should say that. I came here when I was four or five. Uh, my parents having to flee from two countries in their lifetime. And uh, so I said no to that, and I thought, oh my God, that's done for me. But actually, they liked me, despite that. Maybe they liked me because of my honesty. But I'm going to tell you one final story on this. When there was a meeting of the constituency party for the final selection, and I was, um, I was the only woman with, ch there was one other woman. It was a very high, uh, you know, well-contested seat because it was seen, it is seen as a lab Win safe Labour seat, a winnable seat. So everybody wanted it, and in London, as Estelle said. So it was sort of that, it had that added flavour. And um, there were lots of men, some of whom then went on. Charles Clark stood in then and then came up, went on to uh, get another seat and become uh, a, a leading light in the Labour Party. But I was the only person asked about my childcare arrangements. And again, that's something that happened then that just wouldn't um, actually happen today. And I think I've had a very privileged and interesting and challenging <laughs> Uh, existence in politics um, uh, and I feel really 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 privileged to have been able to experience that in my life. Thank you and I think what all your first answers have done is touch on some of the things I was thinking about to my next question which was when I was looking at each of your biographies you've all had this rich and interesting lives in in what are called the real world outside of um, party politics so just thinking about that um, how has that sort of background really informed your uh, political lives and what skills or attributes do you think women politicians need or uh, continue to need? Who do you want to go? Oh, uh, take a step first. I, I think this is a big issue and it, it's changed. I mean, Margaret made the very real point that things have changed from the era which we're talking about. We're talking about our past, we're, you know, our young past. We're not talking about what it would be. But it's really important you understand the narrative of how we get to where we are. So I'm, I'm, I'm going by the way, so one of the things I've come to learn as I've got older, our highest achievement is your starting point. Does that make sense? So whatever we achieve in politics is where you start, your generation starts. So you'll get really ambitious about how awful things are and trying to do things better. But knowing that even your starting point was hard fought for is something that's worth remembering as you go through your own lives in whatever you do. So this answer, I think, it has changed. Now, I really am very critical of the number of people who go straight from Oxbridge into being a special advisor and then get a safe seat in Parliament. It absolutely drives me mad. And I, there's lots of people who I really highly rate as politicians, of whom I'm very fond and close, but have followed that route. And it's too easy for them, and, I, and it's too easy, it's exclusive, and they miss out. So go where I am. I, I lived in, um, I did my teacher training. I, I bought up in Manchester, went to Coventry to do my teacher training. And as I think I mentioned before, got a job in inner city school in, in Coventry, and I got elected. We've all got that background of other organisations to Warwick District Council. 
And if I'm really honest, if someone had have said to me at that time, Estelle, here's a job working with the TUC or the Labour Party in London, I'd have, I'd have jumped at it. I'd have absolutely jumped at it because it, it was what I wanted to do. And I probably even then, I think I could work out that it would give me, I'd be in the right place, I'd have a leg up. But no one offered it me and no one was ever, ever going to offer me that. Even though, you know, I come from a family that's political, it was a northern family. It wasn't a London political family that went back generations. It was a solid northern family. Nine brothers, two of them got to be Labour MPs. High achieving, but without those, cap those, those contacts in the capital. So I would have gone for it, but the luckiest thing I always think was that I didn't. Because when I eventually became an MP, especially when I became um, a, an education minister, I'm absolutely certain that if I did anything right or any of my successes were rooted in those 18 years that I spent teaching in inner city school, I've absolutely no doubt about it. First of all, it was a proper job in the real world. So it had all those pressures of, well, you know what teaching's like. Some of you looked at it as though you're, as though you're school age. Some of you may be teachers. But you can't just go off for an hour or two in the middle of the day to further your political career. It's a job that's got to be done. And it's hard work and it makes you tired. So there's that, I better understand, or I've never forgotten, what it's like to have a job not in politics. Because politicians make rules about people who have jobs that are not in politics. And that's easy to remember. But what it most taught me was what I learned from the kids I taught. And that sounds a bit, you know, a bit high flown. But um, I didn't have a rich background, but I got two very, very supportive families. You know, I born on a council estate. My mum and dad bought their first house um, when I was 10. And my dad was an MP and to buy the house he had to sell the car. So he was going to his constituency, which was the other side of Manchester, on the bus. I mean, you'd never hear of that now. So I didn't have that, but I, I'm immensely rich. I did not struggle as a child. I was well loved, well cared for, and people with high aspirations. What the children taught me, because they were, 70-80% of them came from families that were, you know, whose families came from overseas. And probably half of the kids, or more than half the kids, didn't have English as a first language. And to learn about their background has formed my politics. So I knew I was Labour, I knew the theory, I'd read the history, I'd heard the stories, but working with those kids is what gave me, I don't know, the passion about it. They were the real life examples. And you don't have to be a teacher to do that. You could be in the law centre, like Dawn was, you could be in a local authority, in a rough area, like, like you were. But you've got to do something that gives you that. You've got to do, I feel really strongly about this. The fact that I did something that was more than weaving my way through Labour Party committees, trying to get somebody to put me forward for a safe seat, was the best thing that ever happened to me. But I didn't, it just happened. I was really lucky that no one offered me a job in the Labour Party in Walworth Road because I would have taken it and I would have been a worse politician because of it. So out of that, I think what came out, somebody said to me the other day, could I have a chat to you? I want to go into politics. And I thought about it because I've not had a chat to him yet. I don't, I don't know what his age is. I don't know anything about him. And I thought, what do you mean you want to go into politics? It's not like wanting to go into teaching. And my b best bit of advice to young people is don't set out to go into politics set out to be interested in politics but set out to go into something else and learn about something other and that will inform your politics so it's been a big change in from our youth to this youth but we could all list a whole lot of people who've done the london based special advisors i failed my a levels i didn't go to a russell group university I went to a teacher training college, I've never quite got over that, that stayed with me throughout my life. So, you know, despite my political connection, there was nothing that was going to get me into that route, but it's the best thing that ever happened to me. So I sort of fly the flag for people who've had some experience in the real world. And the last thing I'd say in this, because I can talk too long, because it's, it's one of my hobby horses, as you can see. When you talk to other people, like my constituents, they 
they see that. They don't analyse it, but they know it because you can talk to them about a world that they relate to. Had I gone to Oxbridge, read PPE, gone and been a special advisor to somebody, got handed a safe seat, I wouldn't have been able to do that. The bad thing is, I don't think I would have ever got a safe seat. I got a Tory held seat in Birmingham. I think I could have gone on for another 40 years and I don't think I would have got a safe seat. I think my route would have always taken me, being a woman, not being big in the trade union movement or anything else, I think it would have always taken me to a marginal seat or a Tory held seat. But it doesn't matter, that, that, it was great fun trying to hold on to it. So that, that's my uh, answer to that. Dawn, would you like to come in? Yes, goodness me, this is challenging <laughs> and it's also fascinating because although the three of us have worked together for years, more years than we would care to remember, you know, one of the things that often happens is you're so busy doing the work and particularly, if, as Estelle says, uh, both of us didn't live in London. You know, we wanted to get out of London and back home to our constituencies as quickly as possible. You, you learn lots of things about each other. I feel a bit ashamed, actually, Estelle, that I didn't know more before. But um, well, likewise, yeah. uh, the what do do I think? I, I agree um, with Estelle. I, I want to be really careful. Look, I've seen lots of colleagues who've come through. Um, uh, an easier route into being a member of parliament. Um, they did their degrees, they're very talented, they worked in a political office, they came through being political assistants and then found themselves as political advisors and eventually in um, a safe labour seat. Some of them what we call parachuted in, a shortcut for them. Um, and other people have them, and they they were they were good MPs. But if that's the only way, they were good MPs. I ought to say that. Yes, they were I, good know, MPs I know. I know. Ministers, absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. Estelle, I know yeah. you were yeah. yeah. that. No, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to suggest it. Um, but that's if that's all MPs are, then we're missing. I think we're missing something. We're missing. It's almost like a heartbeat. It's like clapping out of time, um, and. I think that what we have to learn is that life is complex and that people see the same things in different ways and it doesn't make it less valuable, even if you disagree with that. And so my experience, whether it be in community activism, working in a law centre, working in the private sector, or then as... Um, a counsellor meant that I was exposed to the same things, low pay, yeah. discrimination. Um, you know, I can remember as well as yeah. living on council estates yeah. and, um, you know, my mum was very ill at one stage and in hospital and my dad was looking after us and we had to have uh, free school meals, which we didn't have normally because we went home at lunchtime and the humiliation because you had you were getting free school meals that you had to be at the back of the queue after those who were having free school meals because they had paid for it. And so these things inform our mm. understanding. So my community activism did that and encouraged me to look at the world, not always as successful <laughs> when I was a minister, because of the pressures of being a minister, but to try and remember all the things that are important and what drives all of us as <coughs> Labour politicians, which is we want to eradicate poverty, we want to um, uh, get rid of inequality, we don't like discrimination, we, the things that we try and achieve. So I think the most important thing is that you need to have that broader experience. My experience isn't complete. No. It no, was a part yeah, of absolutely. that yeah. when you fit it together, I yeah. suppose, like a jigsaw with everybody yeah. else's, in the collective and collegiate view that a parliamentary Labour Party is supposed to work as, 
when it's out of government or in government. Yes, Robin, you might actually pick that up. Um, that's that's what I I think is important about my route um, in to becoming an MP. It's not exclusive, but it gave me a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And Parliament is hammering out different perspectives and if you haven't got them there in the first place to come to a conclusion yeah, good point. then you get the wrong answer good point. Um, and so that's what I would say but that question also asks what skills and attributes do you need I would say empathy patience most important thing I didn't always learn is when you should just keep your mouth shut <laughs> and maybe not rise to the, to the bait that has been put in front of you. But these are things that we learn in our lives wherever we are. There's nothing unique about the type of jobs that we did as MPs in terms of the demands that are on us. Speak to somebody in the legal profession, yeah, a woman trying to get on in the legal profession, the woman at the top of education, mm -hmm. in the health service, um, anywhere. It's always the same sort of themes. It's about asserting yourself without being a bully. It's about claiming your space as your space without taking away somebody else's. And Larry Whitty once said in the Labour Party when he was General Secretary um, at a women's conference, Margaret, I think you were definitely there, he said, if you wait for men to put their hand up and say, OK, girls, it's your turn now. Um, I'm not going to stand for this safe seat, because I was in a safe seat. I didn't go for other seats. I was in a safe seat. Um, then you'll be waiting a long time, so you have to push them. And that's where the assertiveness comes in. Um, you don't have to be right, but you have to be confident, I think. Margaret's got yes. bags. I wish oh, you to look at, have. I know, I used to look at Margaret and go, I wish I was as short of myself as you are, Margaret. <laughs> I've had a life of doubt. Margaret, would you like to I'm going to try and add, because I agree with sort of lots of, that has been said. I mean, I think the whole thing about politics is we, we claim that we want to to represent the interests of everybody in the society. Mm. So we've got to be representative of everybody in society. It's as simple as that. So um, I think the route, the, the, the route through Oxbridge Special Advisor into, I agree with so much of their style, is just not the right route in. Uh, and I'm absolutely relieved we didn't. So that's the first thing to say. So we've got to be, but the one thing I have learned, I don't know if the other two agree with this, is that actually there are skills in being a politician. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, and you don't necessarily, uh, you don't necessarily have to be, tr you can't, I mean, I, none of us are trained into no. them, but if you don't have them, you won't be as effective as a politician. So it is that empathy that you're talking about, the ability to listen, work collegiately, those sort of things that are, there are skills, there are, uh, uh, an, you know, ability to, to talk to you guys yeah. or anybody, sort of to be able to actually communicate is really, really important. And you see it in the better and the le less effective politicians. That's the third thing I wanted to say was this. I actually became an MP when I was 50. Mm. And, um, and I, and I was 32. You were 32. So I think that is also that we tend to live in a society that um, uh, celebrates youth. And um, uh, I think it's really important part of the diversity that you've got people who've had life outside, life outside Parliament. And actually, when you go into Parliament, you're treated, even though I was 50, I was new, because I was part of a new intake in that year. So it doesn't matter how old, and I think it's great. I worry a little bit. If you look at Cameron, or you look at Blair, or you look at all these people, they come in young, they do their bit, yeah, and then, then they go yeah, out again. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, think, and then they go and do jobs they shouldn't be doing, um, exploit <laughs> <laughs> exploiting in the wrong way the experience they've had in politics. And that sort of, you know, um, is not a healthy trend in politics. So I think there is something to be said of having diversity. It's great we've got some very young people. We have had, uh, but we also had, God, I've forgotten her name, the one, she's, she, We've had somebody who came in in her 60s, who used to be council leader, up in... Val. 
Uh, no, 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 no. Helen Jackson. No, no, no. She came in in her sixties. Uh, in from Kirklees up around the Liverpoolish area. Anyway, uh, it'll come in a minute. But, but uh, so I think there is something about the diversity uh, of that. And, and I, for women, let me just do a bit on women here. I think particularly for women, uh, life is uh, not a sprint. It's a marathon. And, you know, I think whatever you just choose to do in your early years of your life, the choices, you're all going to be working until you're 80, I'd have thought. Uh, by the time you get there. I think you've lost the audience there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you can change, do things again, change when you do things, and it is a marathon, yeah. so don't feel you've got to do it all by the time you're 21. You just don't. Uh, and I think that's an important thing. And the, other, the only other thing I'd say about women, you, you might come on to yeah. in the later questions, is uh, we do work in a different way. I mean, with both Estelle and Dawn and I have worked together on some issues that would never, ever have uh, emerged if we weren't in Parliament, like uh, nursery education, early years, yeah. early years yeah. all the earlier stuff, the childcare policy, uh, flexible working uh, for women to, to have the right to flexible working. There are all these issues which we brought to the table. And I always think one of the greatest things about our time in government was how we did collaborate yeah, you know, as women. Yeah, yeah. We really worked together. And it wasn't just us, the MPs. It was the people in number 10 who were women yeah. as well that we worked. Who, who's, I mean, we had a flexible working is always a great story because both Tony Blair and, and Gordon Brown were petrified of introducing the right to request flexible working because they thought the whole of the commercial business community would hate it. And it was a mix of the women MPs and ministers together with the women working in the offices of both Tony Blair and, and Gordon Brown that actually put such pressure on those guys that in the end they conceded. And I think that's been the most radical reform that would never have happened if we hadn't been members of a government women members of a Labour government. I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up to the audience to make sure I've got time for questions from the audience. So, uh, talking about women, uh, many people have written about um, how supportive women MPs are within Parliament to one another, um, particularly given the, the limited number of women MPs. Um, um, do you think this was the case in your time in Parliament? And has the need for this and the nature of this practice changed over the past decades? I'd say, I'd say yes, very much so. I mean, take up Margaret's last point. Margaret's right in saying that there are some issues that women bring to the political table. But there's also the way of doing politics that is different. It's a, it's a bit... It's not true of everyone. That, 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 would, be, that would be silly, but I think where... Um, you, you've got a group of people that's got no women in. The style of how people do business um, is different than if, it, than if it's mixed. So I think women brought a greater openness and less... M we, we all three can be macho. I mean, I don't want to you know, say we're all at one end, but I think there's a style of politics that was brought into government because there were more women in government and it wouldn't have happened without. So. I think that's true, but I, I, did, I have found women very supportive. Having said that, I've got lots of good men friends who have been equally supportive. I'm thinking Margaret and I both worked close with David Blunkett, and you couldn't have anybody who was a, a better friend or a, a better support than him. So, there's, But I think what the difference is, the women are openly supportive. Women who I barely know were supportive when I had tough times. And I think that's the difference. They had lots of, when I had tough times, lots of male colleagues who know me well, who were tremendously supportive, but women who I didn't know that well, hadn't come across them that much in Parliament, were helpful. So there's that openness, that, that willing to say, and sometimes um, they, they'd spot ways in which they could be helpful that, that men wouldn't. They had a, an empathy with a part of me that I think some of the male people didn't. And, the other thing I, I think is I, maybe two more points. I found the women were better at being together as a group. Politics is strange. You only ever achieve something as a group. But once you get to Parliament, you campaign as an individual. And, you know, you've come from a constituency as an individual. And you know, I think some politicians haven't quite grasped that they've got to be an important part of the group. And I always found my women colleagues 
to be more openly part of a group in terms of being willing to meet and things like that. So I would say that that is true and I was conscious of it of the t at the time. It's not something that I've only thought of in retrospect. Um, that They would talk to me about things and what they would always do, I think I can say with confidence, I, I, Tessa was one, they'd talk to me about the bits of the job they found difficult. None of my male colleagues did that. They talked to me about the bits of the job they were very good at. <laughs> and uh, I, my women colleagues were equally had bits of the jobs they were very good at. But they would open that conversation of, do you find this tough? Only I do. And I, that I don't think it have got from a male colleague. So I'm eternally grateful for that, and long may it continue. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think those support networks are really important. And mine divided into two. When I was in London, that was half of my life um, in Parliament. And then when I was back in the constituency where I lived, and the, the support mechanisms um, that were there. Um, and I think it's, it's, I find it a bit embarrassing to say this, but it was very antagonistic towards women, and it shouldn't have been. Mm. In 1987, when I was elected, in all the political parties in Parliament, I think I'm going to get this number wrong, Sarah, but I think it was 43 women. They were mainly um, Labour women only. 43 out of 600 and... 50 odd. It was like, and, and it was like, I, I was young and I thought, what have I done to my life? I've destroyed it. And all these men were really antagonistic uh, to me, who most of them don't even think I should be here. And when I eventually, I got promoted as a shadow minister, one of our colleagues in the Labour Party who became a Secretary of State told me uh, the only reason was because I wore a dress and because um, they needed to have a bit more diversity on the front bench, you know, the, you know, not that actually you might be good enough to do it. Um, you know, when I went into Parliament, you weren't allowed to wear trouser suits. Women weren't allowed to go in in trousers. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, gracious me. Yeah. And Joe Richardson, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the predecessor. Yeah. I mean, you know, we have moved a long way, but Joe Richardson, who was Margaret's predecessor, um, very poor health in the end, riddled. Um, with arthritis, yeah. um, she led the campaign for us to be allowed, we weren't allowed to wear just trousers, it had to be a trouser suit. And, and it's quite recent that we were allowed to go in in the summer in sleeveless dresses. I mean, you know, this is like, and to find yourself in that situation um, w was challenging. As I said, I was a single parent as well. Um, I couldn't move my son to London, and anyway, I didn't want to because I lived in Bristol, and those were the people that I was doing my best to represent. So I had a support mechanism we all did in London, and it was other women MPs, and it was, actually it was only mm. women MPs. And when things got tough, the people who would contact me, you know, when the tax credit computer decided it would crash, Nothing to do with me, and I was like yeah. doing daily appearances yeah. on uh, GMTV as if I was taking money away from people. Actually, it was money they hadn't had, but never mind. Um, it was only women MPs who were sending me little notes, women Labour MPs, and calling me to say, Look, we're really with you on this. I know it's tough if you, you know, want to talk. Um, so that, I think that collegiate way mm. of trying to support each other um, came out of a necessity because there were fewer of us, but, a, but mm. actually a That's practical true. understanding that um, you, when you're taking decisions, particularly as a minister, if you could do what you wanted, life would be so much easier because the choices you're always offered are none that you want to do. Um, and so I think that women were very supportive. And I found in my constituency, if I hadn't have had the support as a single parent that I did, I wouldn't have been able to do my work. And it was, 
it was women who stepped up to the plate in recognising that. Whether it's still the same, I couldn't say now because my circumstances are different. Um, but it is, it, I think it's a reflection of our generation, mm -hmm. us older ones, um, and that being a member of parliament was seen as a competition instead of a collective act by all to improve everyone's um, opportunities in life and, and standards. Um, and it has taught me a lot about human behaviour as well. I think we don't value that enough. Um, I was going to start on a sort of bit negative, thinking back. I came in after the two of you, just a few yes, years after, yeah. after the two of you. But I remember the first thing was trying to find a women's loo. Oh, yes. <laughs> There wasn't, a, or there were no women's loos, and there was only one. I always tell the story; it's true. But there was only one ironing board in the whole of Paris, yeah. and that was in the women's loo. Yeah. Um, that's changed a bit, but I do remember one of our colleagues in the early days. She had little kids, and she wanted to go home, and we had a massive majority. This was post '97. We had a massive, whatever it was, majority, uh, and she, it was her her daughter's um, third birthday, and she wanted to go home for the birthday party, and the whips wouldn't let her go. Yeah. Uh, so that was sort of, uh, you know, completely stupid. Uh, and my worst story was when I very first became an MP, I was pretty naive. And I was t taken out for lunch by a, a journalist from Sunday Times. I haven't worked out how you handle the media but at those days. And I sort of said, I couldn't quite see why we couldn't have job share MPs. I still can't see why we can't have job share MPs. Because uh, you could perfectly well share all the work and the idea that you vote on your conscience is only true very, very occasionally. On the whole, you, you vote according to your party whip. So it seemed to me a, a very good job to job share, which would make it open to more and more women. And I said this to the journalist, who then wrote it up in the Sunday, in the Sunday paper, much to my embarrassment. I came in on the Monday, and I was called into the whip's office by a woman whip and said, and I was new, I mean, I'd probably been there three, six months, something like that. Uh, and she said to me, how, how dare you say, they put up the picture of me that was in the Sunday paper on the wall, and they were throwing darts at it. Oh, for goodness sake. And uh, they said, uh, if, you, uh, if you really don't want the job, Margaret, there's plenty behind who would take it from you. So it wasn't great in those early days. And that was, and that was women against women as well. So it wasn't always that no. not all the women were, were um, uh, supportive of their women colleagues. So that sounds crazy, doesn't it, today? <laughs> but if I can fast forward to today, and it may be that, you know, Labour's not in government and I want to still get things done. And... Uh, uh, as indeed would the two of you, you were, if you were in the House of Commons. And so now I work really hard with women across Parliament and there is a real sort of, uh, uh, you know, se sense of togetherness with the women, nearly all, not all of them, but with most of the women across Parliament. And we can and do get changes by doing that uh, uh, work across Parliament. Uh, and that, that is a change. For me, that is something that is much, much more. You know, there is a feminist issue, Sarah Everard, all those sort of things that happen in, 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 in our society. You very, very quickly collaborate across the political parties as women. And that, I think, now is a, a change, um, uh, you know, for the good. But um, I often think, you know, we've achieved some, there are many more women now in Parliament. Mm. I'm worried Labour, I'll, I'll finish it because you're going to open to questions. Labour did that, but no other way but having all women's shortlists. None of us came in on that way. But without the all women's shortlist, we'd have never had it. We can't do an all women's shortlist, we can't do all women's shortlist this time. Because the law was written that once you've got over 50% women, uh, you can no longer have that positive action tool and we're at 50.05 or whatever it is, it's, we're just over 50. And I bet you, next time, less than half the MPs in, on, the, on the Labour front will be uh, women. And the other shame for Labour, because we're all yeah, Labour here, is we have never yeah, ever had a yeah. women, woman leader. Yeah. 
And uh, if you look, yeah. um, I, I have absolutely no time for the current government and for the current uh, Conservative front bench. But if you look at the diversity, it's, it's impressive. It, um, and, yeah. and compare it to us, and it is deeply frustrating, but it shows how embedded uh, gender discrimination is. And actually, all sorts of forms of discrimination still are, uh, even within a party on the left whose key value is promoting equality. Well, wow. there is so much Good. in this too that I'm sure people will want to unpack. Anyone would like to ask a question? And we've got the student helpers with microphones. I thought you were leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Right. It's actually about the young people, in a way. So, <laughs> but please, um, thank you very much. Um, I, I, you know, very, very illuminating and inspiring and moving. Um, uh, thank you for sharing um, those experiences with us. Um, I'm, I was actually ex exactly about the young people in that um, all of you have come through, you know, very different routes, but many similarities, but probably at later stages of your career have, have confronted the great deal of hostility and bullying and, and, and all the, um, you know, the toxic environment that social media has created, um, both around issues of gender and, and, and your various positions on, on certain issues. Um, how would you encourage younger women um, to come forward, given that actually the, the dangers are different, but equally uh, uh, challenging and equally daunting, uh, especially for women politicians? Who would like to take that first? Well, uh, it, it is, uh, social media is horrific. And I, it, um, I have I've recently been involved in a fight in the Labour Party against anti-Semitism on the left. And there was a two month period uh, between uh, the publication of the EHRC report and um, the settling on, on Jeremy Corbyn's status, if I put it that way, where I got 90,000 mentions, I mean, I don't even look at them myself. They're, they're, they're vetted, they're looked at by um, a community security trust. And, but I look back to when I was first on the council in Islington, and I well remember we were, I was, I, I, in those days, councils ran in a different way. There was a committee system, and uh, you chaired the committee, so it was a much more democratic way of running local authorities. And I was chairing the housing committee, and we were pull, we were rehousing everybody from a block uh, to do it up. And there was one guy who decided this was deeply unfair. And I, the policeman knocked at our door and said he was, this guy was out with an axe, and he was going to kill me with his axe. So this was 1976. I do remember it because I'd given up smoking and I immediately went back to smoking again. <laughs> <laughs> that was my response. So if you're in the public, if you take a public role, you get, a, a, you, you open yourself to uh, those challenges and twas ever thus. There's a bit of a twas ever thus, although the intensity is greater now. And I think I learned to cope with it in local government actually. Uh, whereas you've realised it's not the real you. You know, they're not, they don't know me. Uh, mm. Papers who absolutely lambasted me in the 80s, I be then became their darling and when I chaired the Public Accounts Committee, completely I'm the same person doing the same sort of things. But it's just a, and it, because they don't know me and they just had me in one box in one place and then another box in there. So I think there's a tendency, it, it is awful. And we should do all, we, and I'm, you know, we've, we've now got an online harms bill where we're working really hard to try and uh, get the, uh, uh, the providers to, to, to sort themselves out and really stop all this abuse online, help stop the abuse, they'll never stop it. Really. But I think you've got to develop a, a sort of persona which recognises that that's not the real me. I sort of talk about compartmentalising. Do you remember I used to talk mm -hmm. about compartmentalising your life? And in the end, through politics, you can achieve fantastic change. And if you have those values that, you know, you want to change the world and make it a better place, which we all share, there, there is no better way of doing it than doing it through politics. So I think you've got to develop that separation between who you are, what you believe in, what you're trying to achieve, and this sort of 
public persona, which is nothing really to do with you. Yeah, just very, very briefly, um, Dawn and I left, Paul, left the House of Commons before social, uh, social media and that, so I've not um, get that abuse or abuse in different forms, but it's nothing like what like you have to put up with. People do that, and I'm not sure how I would cope. But I, I, the thing that worries me most is, you know, young women and young men making decisions of whether they go into politics because of that. And I really, really, really hope that it wouldn't stop that because hopefully we will learn to take the advantages of social media and um, but not treat each other in that way. But Mar Margaret's essentially right. It, it does come with the job and there's a bit of you have to learn to live with it. My only worry, the only extra thing I wanted to add is that when I was an MP I used to worry about learning to live with it because I always had this theory and I think you've just got to avoid it that if you, uh, if you got, grew a thick skin to learn to live with it, you desensitise yourself to the things that you should be sensitive to. So what you're trying to do is remain a sensitive person so you can get politics right, but have a, a hard edge to, a hard, a, you know, a hard edge that protects you from the unfounded abuse and is wise enough to know when the criticism is justified and you should learn from it because not all criticism isn't justified. And I remember one very, very senior politician said to me when I asked him how he dealt with it, he says, the study says, and it was the same thing as you, Mark, he said, I, I picture that I've got a case around, my, around my, my, my head, my face, and when they kick and when they throw things at it, it's that that they're damaging, not me beneath it. So I think, and you can't learn it now, you learn it through experience, to keep your sensitive bit, don't stop feeling. I think that's the key. But have uh, learn to understand, I think you've put it very well, Margaret, it's not the real you. you you're still the other person. But it, it's not easy, but I do think, I mean, it happens to other people as well. I do think there's an element of, of um, developing the skills to manage it, but just keeping that in mind. And also, from my experience, never think there's only you victim to it. Other people are suffering in the same way. It's not just you that people are being nasty to. It's no great pleasure in knowing everyone else is suffering the way, the way you are, but it does give you that feeling of, I'm not alone in having to deal with it, <coughs> and I can talk to other people about it. Just wondering, in the time sake, if I take another question, and yeah, address that to one Dawn to Dawn. For that, yeah. Yes. Would anyone, would anyone school group? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, during your time as MPs, what do you think you your yeah, we're all okay. <laughs> during your time as MPs, what do you think the most positive change you've incited? What the most positive change for your constituencies? Yes, for our constituencies. So, sorry, for my constituency or for society, shall I ask, answer both? Okay. Um, because one, obviously, the wider question benefited my constituents. So I think the most important thing that we uh, did as a, um, a Labour government was um, reducing child poverty, stopping ex exponential growth, um, introducing uh, the minimum wage, and introducing what was called, to begin with, Sure Start, and then became the Children's Centres, which was the integration for um, children younger than three could get it, but of health and education, but also support for parents to give that, try and give that very best start to every child to make the most of their potential. Because actually we throw potential away because some people have privilege and are able to develop their potential. So I think that in terms of um, what I feel 
uh, th there's lots of things, but I think I would I would focus on that and that we did it um, as a government focused on delivering across government, every department. I was a treasury minister then um, in, in, in delivering that and delivering um, increased child benefit, which went on then to be the tax credits because what we were saying was, look, we know parents are responsible for bringing up their children, but actually children are an investment for all of us because they're the future workers, creators of wealth, decision making, and it's in our interest to make sure that um, we do the very best we can to ensure that. So I think that would be a wider. On a, a purely parochial thing, my constituency was huge. It was in the end an electorate coming up 90,000 because of the way Boundary Commission hadn't adjusted it. It was on the edge of Bristol, past council estates, and they didn't have a hospital. And they'd been promised a hospital for 40 years. And then that huge hospital building program that Labour undertook, we finally got um, before we lost power in 2010, only just, that constituency has got its own hospital that's integrated into the big teaching hospitals. And so, you know, my ex-constituents don't have to go miles and miles and miles on a transport system that doesn't exist, so they have to pay for a taxi that they can't really afford in order to get their child to an A&E when they're desperately um, ill. So, so I think if, if I was to say that's what we achieved, I'm really glad, and I hope nobody is going to ask me, so what did you get wrong? Because actually, <laughs> there, there's quite a bit of that as well. <laughs> but that's what I feel was the biggest contribution, and it's all, it's been turned back now. We thought it wouldn't. And it's been, the clock's been turned back. And so the political lesson that I have learned from that is the one I learn about women's rights or anybody's rights. You don't win a battle and then it's over. Mm, true. You have to restate and restate and re-argue and re-establish equality, um, diversity, collaboration, because if you don't, people forget and they move on and you lose it. And that democratic project, um, so it may not be as bad as it was when we started, but unfortunately, a lot of the political battles have become the same again. How are we doing for time, Lindsay? Have we got time for this? Yeah, one more question. Who else would like to ask a question? Thank you all so much. I have a question that was a bit inspired by um, by Can Baroness you Morris. Your comment lower. that sorry, I'll just um, your comment that when you said we left, I left Parliament, and then you corrected and said I left the House of Commons. But I'm curious about um, the gendered political culture of the House of Lords and if there are ways in which it differs from that in the Commons. If two of you who are now sitting in the Lords would like to speak to that question. It wasn't an intentional correction. I can't even remember doing it. Um, <laughs> the House of Lords is really, it, this part is it, split. It's absolutely d divided. Strangely enough, it's very, very diverse. Um, because it's by appointment, not by election. So to get a more diverse House of Commons, you have to get people from unrepresented groups to go through the selection process, and we spent a lot of time saying how difficult that is. And it's not, it's not been easy. It's not just women that it's not been easy for, it's not been easy for people of colour and for people with disabilities, and for the age range. But in the laws, there's appointment. So in all honesty, if you look at the statistics, or when I look round the chamber, there's a lot of people from different faiths, of different colours, of different abilities and disabilities, 
and a far greater range of occupational backgrounds in terms of science, the arts, culture, uh, apart from the, the normal people represented like education, social sciences and academia. So it's good. But where it is, that's, I've just described part of it to you. And there's some members who are really, in my mind, you know, represent the Lords how it used to be, not how it should be now. And the, the, the two go, it's like, I look around, it's like it goes side by side. So at its best, with the people who use it best, I think it does an excellent job. But there are too many, it's, there's too much of it in terms of its customs, its practices, its atmosphere and its membership that doesn't join in that, that reform. Does that make sense? Um, so it's really weird. Whereas I wouldn't describe the House of Commons in that way. As it's, as it's evolved and modernised, it tends to have done it, as, and I'm not saying every individual, but it tends to have done it together. But I find, yeah, you know, I can spend my time in the House of Lords with people who are really, there's some brilliant minds and there's, I think the quality of debate's better. I think the quality of speech is more learned but that is not true of the whole of the institution. And it lives side by side, which I find, I find a problem in my mind to come to terms with, uh, and equally to justify. Yes, please. Um, I think that there's an interesting case study now um, about how the House of Lords works. So the House of Lords is a self-regulating chamber. So in, in the House of Commons, if you want to stand up and ask a question, you might have a, a named question, but then the supplementaries um, are the speakers try and take them fairly. They take them from all sides of the house and they're trying to, they name the person they're going to call to speak and you try and balance it out. It's, quite a complex yeah. mathematical sort of spread. You're trying to get the gender balance right, you're trying to make sure regional, somebody who's got a special interest in that question. What happens in the House of Lords is that it, you it's have to stand up and keep shouting. It's a my Lords, my Lords. What a nightmare. And um, <laughs> it's, it's quite confrontational. I personally don't like it. Um, and I'm not a voting violent. I'm not, you know, I can be as combative as I need to be. I just don't like it. It's terrible for women, don't Now, like what happened exactly, and a lot of women don't want to, and when you get to speak. Now, the interesting comparison is this. In lockdown, yeah. during COVID, we went into hybrid. So we were all on our computers in our homes because we were lots working from home. And now obviously that might have some down points, but what it meant is you had to apply to get in on a supplementary question and you had to apply to speak in a debate and then the whips of the political parties had to share it out there. And what you saw was the participation of women absolutely, in that chamber absolutely. when chuck yeah. <laughs> straight up. That's very true. Don't you? And it very would be true. really interesting now, Sarah, <laughs> post um, lockdown, because then there's been this big debate in the House of Lords um, in the pride of us being, for some people, self regulating, which means they don't really want any. Um, process. I'm not going to call it control. Um, and so we've gone back to how we were and what's happened to the participation rates then. And I think it gives a very good potentially case study on how women in particular work and what they tend to just want to avoid. It's not that we, we can't mix it with the best of them. It's just not necessarily our style. Um, and so I, I, I think that if you compare and contrast the two way the two chambers operate, I think it's, it says quite a lot about women's participation and the choices women make 
when to participate and when not to. Okay. Margaret, would you like to add anything to that? Um, well, I, I, I've learned something. I didn't realise that's what you did now. It was terrible. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't possibly <laughs> comment. <laughs> um, um, the only thing I would say about the House of Commons is um, it is still... I, I find that I don't like the chamber. It's probably back to my I don't didn't don't didn't I don't like that pomposity, and I have seen a change. I've now been in the Commons for nearly thirty years, and when I started, you know there were there were big issues of the day. You'd go into the chamber because you knew you'd be yeah. hearing a really good uh, uh, important speech. So whether it was Northern Ireland or whether it was nine eleven or whether it was the big crash or whatever, you know you had these. Robin Cook yeah, resigning yeah, over yeah. Iraq. You heard really, really good, big, important speech. Now it is Bullington Club. It's horrible, and uh, they just uh, uh, and so it has become more male. I think than the, when you guys were there, uh, because they just it's very personal. It's abusive. It's sort of and uh, it's not strength of argument. It's strength of voice, and mm -hmm. um, uh, I I just hate it. And you know, there are times when you think you've, we probably had better, slightly better contributions, ironically, over the death of the Queen than we've had on any other issues. And it's appalling that one has to say that, but probably that I think that's true. And we'll have to wait and see whether you know, Liz Truss makes a difference in that it's a woman uh, Prime Minister. Um, but um, it is very macho. And where you get the good debates, are outside in the committees yeah. where it's much more collaborative and less competitive and people will listen to each other. So I think actually probably it was better when you were there than it is now. Could be anything about my chair in the chamber. <laughs> it might well be. It might well be. Did I hear the honourable member make a sexist comment? Yeah. If so, <laughs> yeah. we'll now withdraw it. Probably. <laughs> um, on that note, uh, thank you so much, all three of you, for coming along. All responded to the questions so personally and thoughtfully, and I think it's made such a powerful session. So, can we all just join in and say thank you?